Uh, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, every summer we, uh, we still manage to get here and it's just wonderful to see so many friends and thank you for turning out. Um, I have to say that I really hope you'll all turn out next week at exactly the same time to hear the second part of this presentation because I'm competent only to present the first part and uh, you have uh, a real treat in store uh, with, with Peter next week. I also want to um, apologize for the title, which is a little bit misleading. As Gloria said, this is really about the um, political economy of the United States over the last 40 or 45 years. Uh, mine is uh, an historical overview uh, that attempts to explain how we got from where we were uh, 45 or 50 years ago to where we are today. Uh, Peter is then going to talk about what today looks like uh, and uh, how uh, the economy has evolved over this period of time. So um, Jay Gerber was kind enough to point out to me that um, I should not be talking about uh, the end of the Trump presidency uh, bec bec because in fact uh, that is only wishful thinking <laughs> on my part. I'm not speaking for any of you. Um, these two talks, uh, mine on politics and Peter's on economics, explore the evolution of the American political economy over the last 45 years, roughly, from the latter Carter administration of 1978-1980 to the present day. It's a period characterized by what has been called neoliberalism which refers to market-oriented reform policies such as eliminating price controls, deregulating capital markets, lowering trade barriers, and reducing state influence in the economy, especially through privatization and austerity. Uh, in that sense, uh, uh, liberalization uh, it, it, the, the, the term liberal uh, it, it derives really from the European meaning of the term, uh, which is laissez-faire, uh, as opposed to the American corruption, which means progressive. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, deregulation began during the Carter administration, but full-blown neoliberal economic policy awaited the onset of the Reagan administration in 1981. And while it was administered with varying degrees of intensity over the next 40 years, depending on whether the White House was in Republican or Democratic hands, it basically held sway until the Biden administration in 2021. Some would argue that even today, Neoliberalism is exercising a strong influence on economic policy. The neoliberal era has not been a completely unique American phenomenon. It's been a major feature of policy across virtually the entire industrialized world. And in its international form, it has sometimes been known as Reagan-Thatcherism or the Washington Consensus. Its progenitor was the Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek about whom you will hear more next week from Peter. But its most famous American proponent was the late Milton Friedman and his colleagues in what is known as the Chicago School of Economics. Neoliberal thought was also strongly promoted by virtually every prestigious business school in the United States and Europe, and by economists at such powerful institutions as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Peter will speak about how neoliberalism manifested itself in economic policies, particularly but not exclusively in the United States, and what the consequences of these policies have been in terms of economic growth and its distribution, among other outcomes. My contribution today will be to identify the political origins and manifestations of neoliberalism and to show how the resulting economic outcomes have affected our, policy, our politics today and may help to determine their course in the future. Although one could pick any number of historical antecedents, I've picked the Kennedy assassination as the starting point. 
The post-war golden age of American prosperity and global domination was arguably at its peak, notwithstanding the Cold War. Kennedy's sudden violent death was a shock from which the country, uh, it took the country a, a very long time to recover. One consequence of the shock was the triumph of Lyndon Johnson, riding the crest of a wave of sympathy for the slain young president, and thus able to vanquish the conservative Barry Goldwater and push through heretofore impossibly progressive civil rights and social legislation, his great society agenda. But Johnson made two mistakes. One was believing that the progressive euphoria would last, and the second was pursuing an impossible military victory in Vietnam. The pursuit of the latter made succeeding in producing the great society goals an unaffordable illusion. In fairness, Johnson was fully aware that passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 would end the long-standing and always uncomfortable coalition of Northern and Southern Democrats that Franklin Roosevelt had forged 30 years earlier. What he may not have realized was how powerfully that political realignment would affect American politics thereafter. Although he did say at the time that it would mean the Democrats would lose the South for a generation, a prophecy that proved to be all too true. And thus, the Johnson overreach begot a strong counter movement, a deep anger, both from the left and the right, about what happened in Vietnam. From the left for having gone there in the first place, from the right dismay at American defeat. The civil rights legislation provoked a strong racist reaction, particularly in the South, where the candidacy of George Wallace showed Republicans how well an appeal to white supporters of Jim Crow would work politically. And the Republican Party began to reorganize itself along lines advocated by Lewis Powell and William F. Buckley, among others. I'll come back to Powell in a few minutes. <clears throat> As is sometimes said, Barry Goldwater actually won the election of 1964. It just took 16 years to count all the votes. <laughs> Which, after the interlude of the disgraced Richard Nixon and the ineffective Jimmy Carter, brings us to Reagan. Not for a moment forgetting that it was Nixon's Southern strategy that ultimately created the electoral coalition that brought the politically more genial Reagan to victory. With Reagan, of course, began two decades of anti-government action, including tax cuts, deregulation, anti-trade unionism, and all the stuff Peter will talk about in the economic side of this two-part program. Johnson thus was somewhat, but not altogether unwittingly, he, he thus somewhat, but not altogether unwittingly brought about the effective end of the New Deal and the odd bedfellows coalition that enabled it. And the country has never returned to the progressivism it gave rise to or the prosperity it helped to engender. Since then, the Republican Party has represented a kind of bedrock social and economic conservatism, as we have learned to call it, which has turned first, which, which, which has turned first with Newt Gingrich and latterly with Donald Trump into a dystopian populism now bordering on authoritarianism. Meanwhile, thanks to Bill Clinton and then Barack Obama, the Democrats turned Republicanism into, uh, turned, uh, the, 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 de turned, the Democrats turned into Republicanism light, a latter-day version of the party of Dwight Eisenhower and Nelson Rockefeller. That, in my view, is how dramatically the political spectrum shifted between 1964 and 2008. When I was a graduate student almost 60 years ago, I was taught that politics can be defined as, quote, the authoritative allocation of values. I thought then, and I think now, that this was both a hard to understand and curiously bloodless definition. It may have been elegantly parsimonious, but it conveys nothing of the rough and tumble of politics. To me, Politics is more meaningfully defined as the never-ending competition for power between a society's haves and its have-nots. 
The history of American politics can certainly be characterized in this way, whether one looks at the competition between the industrializing North and the agricultural South before the Civil War, the enormous concentration of wealth versus the grinding poverty of industrial employment during the Gilded Age, the mass emisceration of the Depression, or today's historically unprecedented gap between the 1% and the bottom 40%. Through the lifetimes of most of us gathered here in this room, the Republican Party has fought on behalf of the interests of the wealthier segments of society, the landowners, business owners, entrepreneurs, and financiers, while the Democratic Party has fought on behalf of the lower income groups, the great mass of industrial employees, laborers, the bourgeois intellectuals. Rural areas have always tended to be more conservative and thus Republican, while cities have been more progressive and democratic, with a capital D. So let's go back to my starting point. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson had laid out his blueprint for the Great Society, a series of major legislative acts that created the Office of Economic Opportunity, Head Start, education legislation such as the National Defense Education Act that poured billions of dollars into both university and public school education, Medicare and Medicaid legislation, and so on. It represented an enormous pouring of public financial resources into an attempt to ameliorate what Democrats saw as the deepest problem of our society, most especially the seemingly intractable and to Democrats unacceptable persistence of widespread poverty among African Americans in many of our cities and among whites in such rural po uh, pockets as Appalachia and throughout the rural South. Even without the tragic misadventure in Vietnam, this hugely ambitious and expensive foray into social engineering would have provoked a major backlash on the part of social and fiscal conservatives, the traditional base of the Republican Party. And indeed, it did. Bringing into bright public provenance such public intellectuals as William F. Buckley and George Will, and politicians like Barry Goldwater and George Wallace. It's an interesting question how long it would have taken for Johnson's star to fall had it not been for Vietnam. But because of Vietnam, it fell precipitously so that by 1968, with the country in the midst of something approaching political chaos, Johnson withdrew from the fray and Richard Nixon emerged as president. Had it not been for Vietnam, Johnson might have had a chance of accomplishing his dream of bringing Roosevelt's New Deal to full fruition. But the economic and political costs of the Vietnam War made that impossible and enabled the Republicans to regain the White House, if not Congress and the Supreme Court at that time. Nixon won the 1968 election with two strategies. The first was his promise to end the Vietnam War quickly and decisively. The second was the so-called Southern strategy, Nixon's appeal to Southern voters to abandon the Democratic Party, which had pushed on them the hated civil and voting rights legislation, precisely the actions that ended the Jim Crow era that had enabled the Southern wing of the Democratic Party to exist for as long as it did. The Southern strategy proved to be the decisive one because it brought about exactly the political realignment that Johnson had prof prophesied. We have been living with the consequences of this political realignment ever since, and to my mind, it does more to explain the political economy of the past 40 years than any other factor. Although certainly not to the exclusion of other factors, as we shall see. The election of 1968 was certainly a watershed event in American history, and indeed, 1968 was an altogether pivotal year. Everybody in this room remembers that. The Watergate scandal ended the Nixon administration rather abruptly, but it didn't change the underlying tectonic changes occurring in the electorate. It did enable the otherwise unlikely interregnum of Jimmy Carter's four years, his failed presidency, and bad luck. I'm referring to the gasoline crisis, to stagflation, and to the Iran hostage crisis. And it made a swing back to a Republican president more or less inevitable. Following on the heels of the Vietnam debacle, the Watergate scandal reinforced a deepening mistrust of government. 
Carter capitalized on that mistrust by running against the Washington bureaucracy as an outsider, untainted by the Capitol's jaded ways. Another outsider on the left was Ralph Nader, whose crusade against the establishment, both in business and government, helped to further establish a national anti-establishment, anti-Washington atmosphere that was ripe for a new face and a new strong message. And here came Ronald Reagan, a cheerful, amiable warrior, the antithesis of the brooding, glowering Nixon, and an optimistic flag bearer for a resurgent Republican Party. Reagan was not the intellectual leader of this resurgence. Several others, including Lewis Powell, can claim that designation. Powell, who at the time was a lawyer in private practice in Richmond, Virginia, he was soon thereafter appointed by Nixon an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, wrote a now famous memorandum at the behest of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in 1971, entitled, quote, Attack on the American Free Enterprise System, unquote. The Powell Memorandum became the blueprint for the rise of the American conservative movement and the formation of a network of influential right-wing think tanks, foundations, and lobbying organizations such as the Heritage Foundation, the Scaife, Olin, and Bradley Foundations, and the American Legislative Exchange Council. The Republican Party spent the four years of the Carter administration devising a strategy to move the country decisively away from democratic big government and into an era of laissez-faire capitalism. Deregulation, low taxation, and a promised reduction of government spending. And Reagan's near landslide election in, 1990, in 1980 brought into government not only a cadre of officials determined to carry out the strategy, but also a host of new institutions that could reinforce in policy advice and public advocacy the Reagan agenda. What Hillary Clinton many years later called the, the vast right-wing conspiracy. In other words, the resurrection of Republican political dominance dreamt about but almost never achieved since 1932 had at last been accomplished. The New Deal had finally been brought to its knees. It's hard to overstate the economic significance of the 12 Reagan-Bush years. While Reagan was unable to keep his promise of reducing government spending, he delivered on most of the rest of his agenda. He cut taxes, he passed legislation that weakened organized labor, he slashed federal government regulation of business, the financial sector, and the mass media, he appointed conservatives to the Supreme Court. He also pushed for increased defense spending and a muscular anti-communist foreign policy. Politically, he did much to cement the Southern strategy, building an alliance with evangelical political leaders, religious leaders, to cur curtail abortion rights and support conservative religious values. But it was his economic policies that had the greatest long-term impact because of what they did to the distribution of income and wealth in America and how they affected our social structures. Before the, examining the, the effect of Reagan's ne neoliberal economic policy on American society more broadly, we need to look back about 80 years. The New Deal legislation and that of the progressive era that predated it by a couple of decades was designed to respond to the deep-seated alienation that economic policies during first the Gilded Age and later the Roaring Twenties caused. The period between 1890 and 1918 was arguably the most economically dynamic in U.S. history as we began the rapid transition from a primarily agricultural to a thriving industrial nation. The rapid economic growth of that era was accompanied by an enormous gap between those who benefited from the transition and those it left behind, between owners and workers, and between fast-growing cities and the hinterland. This gap also produced a restiveness among the have-nots that became increasingly violent, including the assassination of President McKinley in 1901. Theodore Roosevelt, who succeeded to the presidency on McKinley's death, understood that there needed to be a substantial response to the anger and alienation he saw across the country. And the progressive movement was the result. Some of you may recall my talk on the Progressive Era four years ago in this room when I asked, where is Teddy Roosevelt when we need him? 
After World War I, the Republicans regained control of government as voters tired of the activism of the Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson presidencies. And during the decade of the 1920s, they enacted policies that once again favored the economic interests of business and finance over the social policies of the progressives, resulting yet again in a concentration of economic power at the top and a growing gap between haves and have-nots. The Great Depression brought the Republican decade to a crashing halt, enabling the victory of Franklin Roosevelt and his New Deal in 1932, and the remarkable 20-year run of democratic rule that ensued. Most of us grew up during the decades of remarkable prosperity that followed World War II, a period of unparalleled economic success and social peace during which America became a largely middle-class country. Relatively few people were extremely wealthy, and there were far fewer very poor than had been the case in all previous generations. This remained the case until the disruptions of the Civil Rights Movement and the Vietnam War fractured the prevailing largely white middle-class social contract of the post-war years. As I said earlier, Reagan's election was in many ways the delayed consequence of kaleidoscopic politics that followed the pivotal events of 1968. 1968 really frightened much of white middle-class America. By the time he was assassinated in the spring of 1968, Martin Luther King had already lost control of that part of the black rebellion in America that had abandoned nonviolence, the part that was now following Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. Lack of success in Vietnam helped Americans realize that this country was not the inevitable victor in all armed conflicts and global hegemonic power. And many were doubting not only our power, but also our moral compass. Nixon's Southern strategy and the size, geographic reach, and intensity of support for George Wallace showed how strong persistent racism was across much of the country. Peter will talk in some detail next week about the economic policies pursued by Reagan and subsequent administrations and their consequences in terms of economic growth and distribution. You will learn a great deal about the now widely recognized hollowing out of the middle class. How many Americans who had enjoyed well-paid, secure jobs and good health insurance and retirement benefits found them year, themselves as the years progressed with less and less job security and fewer and fewer benefits. And if it didn't happen to them, in many cases, it happened to their children. Much of this deterioration in personal welfare was the outgrowth of the weakening of labor unions and of collective bargaining. All of this was a direct outgrowth of the economic policies outlined in the Powell Memorandum and pushed by Milton Friedman. Business groups aligned with the Republican Party, particularly the US Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, and think tanks like the Heritage Foundation, American Enterprise Institute, and the Cato Institute. The decline in manufacturing occurred because neoliberal economics meant globalization. Many of the companies that employed well-paid American workforce of the 1950s and 1960s took advantage of the liberalization of the system of international trade to move their factories overseas to labor markets with considerably lower wages and worker benefits, especially in Asia. Meanwhile, the post-industrial American economy was shifting dramatically away from manufacturing and towards services, producing a workforce that was itself deeply bifurcated between high-paying jobs in finance, technology, consulting, and the high end of health care, on the one hand, and low-paying jobs in retail sales, fast food, low-end health care, on the other. Many of those employed at both ends of this burgeoning service sector were immigrants. Those workers, usually lacking higher education, who were displaced by the flight of manufacturing jobs abroad found themselves either unemployed or consigned to much lower paying and insecure employment in what has come to be called the gig economy. These broad trends, some of which predated the Reagan administration, continued well beyond the 12 Reagan-Bush years, persisting through the 24 years of the Clinton, Bush, and Obama administrations. To be sure, social and economic policies were hardly identical through these administrations, 
But I think it's fair to say that none of them substantially modified the basic commitment to neoliberal economics. For example, after a huge struggle, the Democrats managed in the 21st century to create a 20th century national health care system through the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare. A major improvement on the system it replaced, but still a far cry from the national health systems of virtually every other high income country. But fundamentally, a lot of things got worse. Gun violence has increased academic, epidemic proportions. American primary and secondary public education is producing graduates who are unable to compete in the post-industrial economy. Life expectancy is not, is, is not only not increasing among some segments of the population, it is actually declining, especially as a result of high infant mortality, drug addiction, and suicide. White America enjoyed nearly 25 years of prosperity and domestic tranquility the most prosperous and tranquil in our history following World War II. The subsequent nearly 50 years have been neither as prosperous nor as tranquil, at least for most of us. A small and declining segment of the population, including most of us in this room, have been the exception. While the great majority of Americans have found their quality of life declining and their levels of anxiety and frustration rising. And the growing pathologies and tensions of these years since the late 1970s finally exploded in 2016 with the election and subsequent administration of Donald Trump. How did that happen? How did a country that was so apparently happy, prosperous, and satisfied, the envy of much of the rest of the world, get to the point that an utterly unqualified and unscrupulous grifter, a man nearly every political leader in the country described as manifestly unfit for office, could become president and subsequently preside over such a corrupt and incompetent administration. Trump's election was not only possible because, was only possible because by the time of the 2016 election, we were a country of two warring camps, as we remain today. Which brings me back to my earlier definition of politics, competition between the haves and the have-nots. I think that 40 years after the Reagan administration, the Reagan revolution, America has become almost a two-class society. Those who, as a consequence of personal wealth and higher education, could be, compete successfully in the post-industrial economy, and those who, by virtue of their declining relative wealth and lack of higher education, felt largely excluded from successful participation in that economy. By 2016, the former largely voted for the Democratic Party and were to a very considerable degree resented, even despised, by the less fortunate. Those Hillary Clinton described in, for her, catastrophically inept phrase, the deplorables. I've tried to explain in political terms how the country has evolved in the period since the Kennedy assassination, with references back to the antecedents of our post-World War II prosperity and the Progressive Era and the New Deal. I have tried to explain how reactions to Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs, reinforced by the anger and disappointment surrounding the Vietnam War, led to the Reagan administration and how Reagan administration policies, as well as those of the administrations of Bush, Clinton, Bush II, and Obama that followed, ushered in one of the greatest periods of income and wealth inequality in American history. That enormous inequality, I believe, has a great deal to do with the growth of widespread resentment and anger among those left behind in America's post-industrial economy. <clears throat> the have-nots, an anger and resentment that has not only been fed and amplified, that, that has only been fed and amplified by Donald Trump's dystopian demagoguery. Excuse me for a second. Peter is going to explain in uh, detail both how this inequality came about and its economic consequences in <clears throat> a lecture next week that I am sure you will find fascinating and enlightening. 
It remains for me to say just a word about the politics of redemption, how we might reverse the political economy of the past 40 years to produce a better future, perhaps for our children, but particularly for our grandchildren. First, America is not going to revert to a primarily industrial economy in which a high, <coughs> a high school education or diploma qualifies a large majority, majority of the population successfully to enter the labor market. The post-industrial economy demands higher levels of education and technical skills. Today, employers are having great difficulty in many high-tech and consulting firms finding the talent they need. Immigration, as limited as it has become, is not sufficient to meet those needs, and too many Americans lack the requisite skills. An obvious answer is investment in public education, both at the secondary level to prepare students for college and university, and at the university level to prepare them for the jobs in the modern economy. Additionally, much stronger technical training at both the secondary and tertiary levels is required by the increasingly digital technological world we're entering. Second, <clears throat> we need to build on the start made by the Affordable Care Act to create a modern, efficient, economically sustainable healthcare system. Americans pay far more than citizens of any other high-income country to get less healthcare. There are many models out there to choose from, and there is simply no excuse for the country with the most sophisticated medical infrastructure in the world to serve its citizens so poorly. We must reverse the trend towards stagnating and even declining longevity, which among other things also means addressing the appalling rise of obesity in America. Third, and to my mind most important, we simply must begin to reform our 18th century political structure. There may have been excellent reasons for the founders to make as many compromises on actual democratic institutions as they did, but what may have been the right balance between majority rule and minority rights in 1789 is not the right answer today. When two of the last four presidents were elected despite losing the popular vote, when gerrymandering results in state legislatures that overrepresent one party and underrepresent the other by such margins that the legislature does not reflect the popular vote or prevailing political will. When congressional districts are drawn in a way that results in a House of Representatives whose composition is seriously skewed in the same manner, and when there are virtually no restrictions on how much money special interests can invest in political campaigns, you wind up with a system that is seriously rigged. Not in the ways Donald Trump alleges, but in precisely the opposite direction. We simply must address and correct these and several other glaring deficiencies in our democratic institutions, lest the institutions that were designed to protect minority rights continue to subvert the will of the, minor, of the majority. So fearful were the founders of the so-called tyranny of the majority that they constructed a system, including the small state bias of the Senate and the Electoral College, neither of which reflects the distribution of the population, that makes majority rule too often the exception rather than the rule. For two examples beyond those of the elections of George Bush in 2000 and Donald Trump in 2016, just look at how far Congress is from public opinion on abortion rights and sensible ownership of firearms. There are many things in America that need fixing, but I maintain that we will fail to address any of them effectively until we fix the political system. Our economy is fundamentally strong, and a well-regulated capitalist economy has proved its superiority over all other economic arrangements. But as Martin Wolf argues in his brilliant new book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, and I quote, the health of our societies depends on sustaining a delicate balance between the economic and the political, the individual and the collective, the national and the global. That balance is broken. Our economy has destabilized our politics and vice versa. We are no longer able to combine the operations of the market economy with stable liberal democracy. A big part of the reason for this is that the economy is not delivering the security and widely shared prosperity 
expected by large parts of our society. One symptom of this disappointment is a widespread loss of confidence in elites. Another is rising populism and authoritarianism. Another is the rise of identity politics of both left and right. Yet another is loss of trust in the new notion of truth. Once this last happens, the possibility of informed and rational debate among citizens, the very foundation of democracy, has evaporated." End quote. This is the crisis Wolf talks about in his book, and Peter and I are so worried about as we speak to you this month. America is not alone in its struggle to sustain a healthy political economy. Much of the Western world faces similar challenges. But I think our challenges are greater than those facing much of Europe, and that the consequence of American failure successfully to meet these challenges would be catastrophic for the entire Western world, given our size and outsize influence. I don't want to leave you disheartened and depressed. I am fundamentally <laughs> an optimist. And I believe that the American prospect still has enormous potential. One of its most important elements is its incredible capacity for self-correction. Autocracies cannot self-correct. Democracies can. And this one has repeatedly throughout our history. Sometimes it takes a shock, a depression, or a war to awaken us or impel us to redemptive action. Other times it's a strong and courageous leader. Often it's both. We are at such a moment today, I believe. The one thing virtually all Americans can agree on is that the country is in deep trouble. The polls all confirm this. What we can't agree on is how to get out of this hole we have dug ourselves into. I can't tell you I know the answer, but I do believe that preserving, protecting, and attempting further to perfect our democracy is an essential precondition for success. Thank you. I'd love to take some questions, and uh, I think that Liz and Gloria have a mic. So if you'll raise your hands and wait until one of them recognizes you, we can go from there. What a, what a great education you gave us, and thank you for that. I want to go back to your comments concerning the Chicago School of Milton Friedman and how many of those policies are adapted by or used by the Republican Party for their agenda. How do you explain the phenomenon today where so much support um, for Trump has been through the hollow middle class that has been harmed by those policies and still continue to support the Republican Party of Trump today? And yet they still continue, and will be continued to be harmed. The, uh, the, the question was, um, the, um, I talked about the Chicago School and Milton Friedman and the impact they had on uh, the economic policies that have led to uh, such a wide-ranging discontent in the United States. Why is it then that that same Republican Party uh, nominated uh, Donald Trump, uh, and uh, that uh, that <clears throat> that uh, the, the 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 anger uh, manifested by so many voters in voting for Trump uh, occurred the way it did. It. Did I get that about right, Brian? Yes, and, and they're and they're the group that's been harmed economically the most. Yeah. Well, it's the famous question of what's the matter with Kansas. I mean, why why do people so uh, obviously vote contrary to their self-interest? Uh, as they do. I, I think the answer is that um, they don't make the connection in their own minds between the economic policies pursued by the Republicans and the decline in their own economic well-being. Uh, to the extent that they did understand that, as they obviously did at the time that FDR was so overwhelmingly elected, uh, I think it would be a different story. But I think the Republicans have been very effective uh, in communicating in a way that blames the Democrats for much of the, dis, uh, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the misery uh, that, that much of the electorate experiences. 
Other questions? Yeah. If you just follow up on that question, I, I was a little, thank you. Just following up on that, I was a little surprised that you didn't suggest that the migration of some low income, less educated white voters to the Republican Party reflects uh, some of the social policies of the Democratic Party. I mean, is, isn't that an issue too? Yes, it is, and, and I, I'm glad you brought you bring that up. I think that um, <clears throat> the, uh, the, the excessive uh, focus on identity politics on the part of the political left, uh, and uh, I, did, I did mention that, but I, but I also said in, in the quote from, um, from uh, Wolf that, that, it, that identity politics really was practiced by both sides, it was much more. By, by the Democrats, and I, I do think that um, the, uh, uh, that, that the that the Democrats in uh, in in much of of of, this, of 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 the social policy that that they have advocated uh, have pushed um, many re, many many middle class and middle uh, of the road voters. Uh, into the uh, the hands of the of, of the of the evangelical right, uh, and yes, I, I I think that that's a that's a very fair point. Uh, you know, I I talk very much about the how the economics has affected uh, the, the politics of the day, and and not so much about uh, ab about social policy. Uh, but in fact, on on social policy, I think in the in the in the battle for people's minds. Uh, the Republicans have uh, have done a much more effective job. Wonderful talk, Steve. It's very enlightening. Uh, one thing that you did not mention is the perpetual reserve, which has been. I'm sorry. The what? The, the Federal Reserve. Oh, the Federal Reserve. Which has been a political anchor, if you will, over the years. And its function has changed. Uh, and it's, it's really different now than it was, for instance, in Milton's Freedmen's Day, where it was just focused on the money supply. Uh, in recent years, uh, it's been focused on social issues, uh, and uh, even though it's been apolitical, it, it, it steered the course very constructively. Uh, regardless of the political nonsense, uh, I think, and, and regardless of who has been head of the Federal Reserve, including Powell, going back to Greenspan, you know, Somehow, the president's presidency uh, has chosen uh, people to head the Federal Reserve, regardless of their political uh, views. Powell, just who was uh, appointed by uh, Trump, and you know, it was somewhat surprising that uh, Biden chose to, to keep him. Phil, is there a question in there? <laughs> Why did you choose not to focus on the Fed? Uh, as part of it? Um, <laughs> Peter, <laughs> you want to help me with this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Peter's suggestion is you come back next week and uh, and, and and you'll hear you'll hear about the role of the, of, of the Fed. It's not it's not my uh, not my area of strength, Phil. By the way, the talk was excellent. But I think of three places: California, Texas, Illinois, New York. Democratic states. Very progressive. People are leaving those states in droves, going to Florida, Texas, the Carolinas. In fact, it's very difficult when I visit my son in North Carolina to hear a southern accent. Okay. So they all sound like they're from New Jersey. <laughs> Why do you think that is? That they're going more towards 
the states that are not as progressive? I don't think it has anything to do with politics. I think it has everything to do with economics. It's where the jobs are. Uh, the um, co companies, uh, I'm sorry, the question is why are people leaving uh, California, Illinois, and New York, and moving to Texas, and Florida, and North Carolina? <clears throat> and, um, and, and, and the reason is that, uh, that, the, uh, that the former three states are all uh, very high cost, if, if also high wage jobs. I don't think that wages have kept up with the cost of living to the extent that would have been necessary for those people to stay where they are. When good jobs, high paying jobs, are offered uh, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the other states, uh, the migration to those states is natural. Uh, and you know, what, I, what I think is that the people who are migrating eventually are going to change the politics of those states to which they're moving, but it's taking time. We keep waiting for, for Texas to turn purple. <laughs> we keep being told it's about to become purple, and it never quite gets there. Yeah. I see, I, in my view, one of the big uh, forces that affects our politics is the media, and the, my, the change of the media over the period we've been talking about from basically a broadcast medium with three networks, all of whom were trying to attract as many viewers as possible, um, that studiously avoided any um, commentary, uh, one way or the other, to these sort of silo uh, media that we have now, which that's the biggest audience, not in whatever the straight news program is, but opinion shows. Yeah. You know, to, to what extent do you think that's affected our politics, or do you think the politics is what's affected the media? I think it is our politics that created the circumstances in which that change has occurred. Uh, Reagan did away with the Fairness Doctrine. Um, it, the Fairness Doctrine only applies to only, television. Only, only to television. It applies only, only to, yeah, I know that, I, I know that, I know that. And I, and I don't want to say that, uh, that, that the abandonment of the, of the Fairness Doctrine is completely responsible for everything that's happened in, to the media. Social media happened without any reference to the, to, to the, uh, to the Fairness Doctrine. But it is true uh, that with the, with the advent of, of uh, right-wing talk radio in the 1980s, uh, the political um, complexion of the country really began to change. I think that Rush Limbaugh and his, um, uh, and, the, and those who, who copied him and followed him have made an enormous difference uh, in, uh, in, in, in the formation of political attitudes. Uh, and I do think that, um, that with, with deregulation of, of television uh, broadcasting, uh, that enabled um, uh, the the establishment through through uh, the cable system uh, of uh, alternative voices, like particularly Fox News. Uh, it also has contributed very in a very major way to the uh, to the to the change in in our politics. Um, I think that the, the the way in which the media has change the political landscape in this country is a huge story uh, and a parallel story to the one that, that, that I'm trying to tell here. And because I couldn't talk about everything, I didn't talk about the media. Uh, if, if I were to give this talk uh, again, maybe next summer, uh, a, 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 another version of it, I might go into that because it's a subject actually that fascinates me and I have not studied carefully enough to feel as if I'm, I'm ready to, to pronounce on it yet, but uh, thanks for the question, because I, you're, you're right. I mean, it's, it's made a huge difference in, in, in ways that we're all aware of, but can't really fully explain. Uh, how about our moral compass? Don't you feel that that's played a very significant role in this, and greed? I mean, how can Tucker Carlson lie like that? And not just him, it goes on and on and on and on. I feel that we've lost a moral compass in this country. Yeah. Um, 
I hope you're wrong. Um, I mean, the, the, how about our moral compass, she asks. Uh, how, does a, how does somebody like uh, Tucker Carlson uh, get to say what he says? Uh, and um, and, and it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a fair question. I mean, there was, um, I guess, in, in, the, in, in, in the middle of the 20th century when most of us <clears throat> were growing up, um, a, uh, a moral, uh, uh, an ethical and moral environment uh, that would have made a presence like Tucker Carlson's almost unthinkable in, in, in broadcast uh, journalism. Um, and th there was a, a kind of self-regulation, I think, but it was also born out of uh, a, I, I think, a kind of a, a national moral code of, uh, that, that largely emanated from our political leadership. Uh, and I think that um, the political leadership in this country, uh, not everyone by, by a long shot, but, but many of them um, are uh, expounding uh, views and uh, taking liberties with, uh, with, with, with sort of traditional ethical and, and moral positions that, um, that we find shocking today. Uh, certainly would have found shocking uh, 30 years ago. And you know how that has happened, I mean, why it has happened. Uh, there's been a coarsening of the culture, I think, uh, sort of across the board. Uh, there are things that are, that are, are shown now uh, in Hollywood movies and on network television that would have been unthinkable 30 years ago. Uh, and I think it, it, there, there, there has been uh, a, a kind of libertarianism that has emerged uh, that, uh, that, that, that encourages uh, that kind of uh, e extremism. So as far as moral compass is concerned, I don't know. But I mean, it, um, we, 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 we certainly are, are far less a church going uh, population than we were. Uh, uh, church attendance is way, way down from, from where it was. But that alone doesn't explain it. I mean, it isn't, it isn't organized religion that gives us our moral uh, grounding for the most part. But, but, but it is a political culture uh, that, that has dramatically changed, I think. Uh, and I, I, I share your, uh, your concern. And um, and in fact, I, I wish I had asked myself the question you asked uh, in thinking about this talk, because it's, uh, it, 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 it really is, in many ways, a fundamental question. Um, Steve, you really helped us understand um, where, where we are and how we got here, I think. Um, we, you know, we're not young folks, or I'm not a young folk. At how, how can, what action or actions would you, do you think would enable us to influence our grandchildren, our children, in, in, in conversing about this kind of affair? Find in. Did everybody hear the question? What? Uh, <laughs> how? How? How should we be talking to our children and our grandchildren uh, in order to uh, help them uh, uh, overcome the political and social environment uh, we find ourselves in today? Um, it's it's uh, you know it's the it's the question we all ask ourselves all the time, and uh, I think that uh, in in terms of the, the the subject matter of my talk this afternoon, the teaching of civics in public school um, was a really important part of, and and a lot of times we didn't even realize that what we were being taught was civics. 
but we were in the way in which we studied history and the way in which we talked about current events and so on in, in school, we were taught physics, civics. And I think that um, that's to a considerable extent been lost in public education. I think that also, I don't think our public education system um, has the same kind of socializing impact that it did in, in the era when we went to public schools. I think public schools were a hugely influential influence on American political culture. As, as it existed in the, in the middle of the, of the last century. And the deterioration of public education and particularly the lack of attention to the teaching of civics and the teaching of the civic culture uh, has a lot to do with, with, with what has, the things that have gone wrong. Um, so where would I start? Uh, I, I certainly would start with, uh, and as, I, as I tried to suggest here, I mean, I think we have to rebuild our, our, our politics, but I think that rebuilding our system of, of, sec of primary, secondary, and tertiary education uh, is, is, is where I would direct my attention. I mean, as a parent, as a grandparent, um, trying to do what we can to improve the uh, capacity of our system to educate young people um, is, is, is where, where I would focus. I mean, it, it, it's sort of a, a cliche, but, uh, but, but starting with, with young people and helping them find their moral compass uh, and, and helping them understand um, the difference between good and evil, et cetera. I mean, I, that's where I would start. Um, in the future, I think we should all stand when we have questions. It's easier, I think, for us to understand it. Thank you very much for a great conversation. I'm motivated now to come back and listen to Peter. Good. <laughs> um, I would also love to hear your view of where does it, where does the operational effectiveness in our government, not the political effectiveness of our society, but the operational effectiveness in politics, and therefore in other major institutions like healthcare and public education, cause us to be in the situation we're in today. I'm a firm believer that we are challenged because of our size of our country and our view towards, towards opportunity, but our healthcare system is broken. It needs to be fixed. Um, our so our uh, entitlement programs are broken. They don't deliver the targeted results that we want them to effectively, cost effectively, not efficient, not just efficiently. And that gives people tremendous concern about can the government do what we need to have it done. Yeah. And that's a different conversation than the two points that you and Peter are giving us. And I'm not sure who the expert is, but there are a lot of people who have grown up in the operational bowels of everything we do and have views on what could be done to make these things operate better and deliver what is expected. Um, it affects costs, it affects all these other things, so, and attitudes. But um, it'd be good to hear from you and Peter about, do you think that's a major, I believe it's a major contributor to our frustration and the frustration of our political systems. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I did try to uh, address uh, some of what you're uh, suggesting, Rocco, with uh, my comments about um, the, <clears throat> the, the, the growth in uh, suspicion of and hostility toward government uh, that uh, I, I think to a considerable extent started with Vietnam. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and followed by, I mean, when, when Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, won the White House by running against the government, running against Washington, uh, he was sending a real signal uh, about uh, that, that it was a, 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 a secret to political success is to run against the government. And Reagan, of course, did that in spades. Uh, and it became pretty much conventional wisdom that the, the route to political success was to berate the government or to down, 
to, to, to speak negatively about the government and, or, or to criticize the government or to make fun uh, of, of government. Um, when I was coming out of college, it was honorable to get a job in public service. Uh, in the generation that followed mine, nobody who graduated from a good college wanted to go anywhere near public service. They all wanted to go into finance or, uh, or business. And uh, you know, the business schools thrived, and, um, and, and, and the public service was, uh, w w and, and in fact, uh, I can tell you that as, as a public servant myself for 20 years, uh, Congress consistently cut spending um, for um, uh, on government. Uh, we would get money for programs, but we couldn't get money uh, to pay for good staff uh, for, for, or, or for training uh, of, of, of people. Uh, so I, you know, I think there was a, an anti-government mentality that developed in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, that uh, that really first demoralized and then demotivated um, a, a lot of, uh, of of the public service and and, and created uh, an environment in which people didn't expect the government to perform uh, and so it didn't uh, and so rebuilding a, a a public service which actually works. Uh, is a major undertaking, and I, I, I thank you for, for raising this because it's you know when when you say well what do we need to do in order to get back on track, I think building a competent public service uh, is a very important part of the answer to that. And I think it help it impacts public education mm -hmm. as much as anything else. And health, I mean as as you say, it, 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 health and education for, for sure, you yeah. know. You see, it seems to me that tax policy plays a big role in terms of the movement of population from one set of states yeah. to another set of states, uh, both in terms of attracting corporations with lower taxes and in terms of attracting people with lower taxes. Can you comment on that? <laughs> Yeah, well, it cuts both ways, Stu. <laughs> uh, cutting, cutting taxes is very effective for attracting uh, corporations and, and, and labor, but it, <laughs> but it also uh, severely restricts the ability of government to do what it's supposed to do. Uh, it, you're you're going to hear much more from Peter on the, on the, on, on the issue of tax policy uh, next, next week, and I don't want to tread on, on his ground, but I think that uh, a society that hates paying taxes as much as our society does deserves the government it gets. <laughs> and, uh, and I mean that seriously. I mean, we, we, when, when we were, when the, when the top marginal rate was 90% or 80% as it was in the Eisenhower years, we had a thriving economy, among other things, and a government that was capable of carrying out the functions that we expected it to. We have, with, with, the, with the generations of tax cuts now that we have exposed ourselves to, we have a government that doesn't function anymore because nobody wants to work for it because there isn't enough money uh, to, to support it. And uh, I, th I think, uh, again, I mean, as, as, as Rocco has, has suggested, uh, the, the way out of this hole we're in uh, may be a more competent public service. The, the route to a more public, competent public service is to pay taxes at a rate at which you can support it. In education. Do you stay? Yeah, hi. hi. Do you, uh, Hold it right up to your mouth. Can you foresee any ability to change a government that does not represent its people, which is what we have now? We have um, the Congress, the just, the judicial, uh, are representing something totally different than what most people are looking for. Um, and is there a way out of this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's the same question, similar. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, 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 and the, the, same, the same question occurs to us every day, individually. 
Um, I don't have an answer to that question. I, I think that um, <clears throat> much of the time I wind up saying the only thing that is going to shake us out of this lethargy is some kind of a major shock. Uh, a shock to the system. I think about uh, you know the Great Depression having been that, or if that wasn't enough, then World War II uh, that that <laughs> that followed. Um, the assassination of McKinley uh, gave rise. It 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 really shook Teddy Roosevelt to his core. That you know that we we've got to do something to to stop the 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 anarchist movement that that allowed that to happen. Um, I, I, you know, World War II shook us out of our lethargy. It also revolutionized Western Europe. I mean, after, uh, you know, generations after generation after generation of, of warfare, Western Europe after World War II realized that they just had to do things differently. Uh, and country after country invented new ways, much of it with our help, by the way, uh, of, of doing things differently. And Europe has been uh, stable and prosperous uh, for a very long time now as a, as a consequence of finally coming to its senses about many things after, after the Second World War. I don't, I don't know uh, whether it takes sh huge shocks to the system to get things to change, but you know, a country that has been as successful as this one has, as self-satisfied as this one has been for such a long time, it take a hell of a shock to get us to realize that we really got to do things dramatically differently. Uh, you know, when, when I talk about the need to reform our political structures and our political system, do I have any hope that we're going to actually do that? No, uh, I, I don't. I mean, I think you know, you you would almost need a new constitutional convention. Uh, or a series of really radical uh, political reforms, like moving to a multi-party, multi-district uh, system in which you get real competition. By the way, there is in the current issue of The Atlantic a really interesting article uh, in which a, a number of, of, um, of, of scholars are, are beginning to advocate that we move away from the single member district to multiple, multi-member multi districts that will produce a multi-party system that would give much more nuance to the political differences and complexion of, of the country. Uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, um, Alexandria uh, Ocasio-Cortez, AOC said the, you know, she said only in America could Joe Biden and I be in the same political party. Uh, and there's a lot of truth uh, in the fact that, you know, we, we, we force people into these enormous tents. Uh, and, you know, Southern and Northern Democrats were the, were the classic example of, uh, of, of, an, of an unholy alliance. A, there, there's a lot to be said for parliamentary democracy in multi-party uh, systems to, to lower the political pressure. I mean, I think that given the extent of polarization in this country today and the intensity of dislike of the other side that exists, uh, a, a, having a, a, a release valve of the kind that, that multi-party districts represent would be one way. But are we ever going to get there? I mean, do we have any hope of getting there? You know, I'm, I, I can't be optimistic. What would it take? for us to realize that we have got to do something to reform this 1789 constitution to up, update it and upgrade it. I mean, we have, we have by far the oldest existing constitution in the world. There's no other country that's even close to us in the, in, in the age and, and the, and the uh, rigidity of its, uh, of its political framework. Uh, and you know why, why, why don't we understand that a system devised for the society that existed in 1789 might not be perfect <laughs> for the system that exists in 2023? So you talk about a catastrophic events like Kinley's assassination or World War II, but wasn't 9-11? And what did not change? as a result of that, because isn't that 
the same category of you know, catastrophic event? I hoped so at the time. I really did. I thought, well, maybe this will do it. And then I thought, well, maybe 2008 and the, and the, the economic crisis uh, would, would do it. Um, obviously, they weren't big enough. <laughs> In view of what you said before, considering the choices we might have, do you think a no-labels party could have any traction this time? God, I hope not. <laughs> the question was, would a no-labels party have any traction at this point? Um, no, uh, our system it, it does not it, is not kindly to third parties. Uh, they always wither and die, and they die because of the structure of our of our electoral system. Um, <clears throat> and that's why I talked about multipartism because I think that uh, if we had a multi-party arrangement, uh, an arrangement in which three or four different parties could be competing for the same set of seats, um, we, would, um, uh, we would relieve some of, some of the pressure. But, but a no labels party, uh, I think, would have uh, nothing but a deleterious effect. <laughs> They'll come to you. <laughs> we're, trying, we're trying to get as many voices, I guess, as we can. that are on, on board for that, uh, we, we could have the, uh, the largest number of the votes would be the winner. Uh, the only thing is uh, we would have to uh, uh, be, be very careful about uh, uh, counting a vote because that could be self-ballot boxes. Why would uh, doing away with the Electoral College I, that change in any way the uh, the way in which votes are counted. No, no, if you threw out the electoral college, yeah, then we have a very low turnout, basically, as opposed to many other countries. So it would be behoove everyone to go out and vote, right? If it's the total number of so many million versus so many million nationally. I, I don't think uh, doing away with the electoral college would change that very much. Okay. What it would change is um, the, way, the, the, the way in which votes are counted. Uh, and, and that might mean that the people, the person who actually won the most votes would win the office, yes. which uh, hasn't happened uh, all the time lately. No, but uh, uh, I think there were secondary uh, candidates sometimes and things like that. Well, anyway, um, we... Uh, the House of Representatives, which is a lot of the gerrymandering, if we had uh, at large, all of the members of the House were at large for each state, then, then there would be uh, those who had the, those candidates in the whole state would be the winners, and it wouldn't be divided, state wouldn't be divided into districts. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you didn't have districts in the states, uh, and everybody running was, was, was you'd, be, you'd have a, a house that looked like the Senate. Yes. Uh, and everybody, uh, uh, yeah, right. Uh, yes, that's true. Is it? Generally speaking, um, third party candidates uh, have worked very much to the disadvantage of um, the Democrats. Um, and, <laughs> and I think about a no labels candidacy in the current environment in those terms. Uh, am, I, am I sort of categorically opposed to the idea of no labels? Candidates, yes, because I, I think that um, 
you need to know what you're voting for. I mean, you, you, you need, if, if no labels simply means I'm not a Democrat or, or a Republican, uh, then what, what does it mean? Uh, you neither Biden nor Trump. No, yeah, and it doesn't mean no policies. It, it, no, it, it might not. But but you know, we, since since we do identify ourselves with platforms, we do identify ourselves with a body of political beliefs or philosophies. And, you know, it, it, a no labels party would have to at some point uh, define itself in that way. Uh, and then you've got a third party. I mean, it, 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 and it would be called something uh, other than no labels. Uh, you know, if, no labels means I don't stand for anything, as far as I'm concerned. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. When you think about some of the candidates who are well, who, who is a no labels candidate? Well, the, the, the two uh, duos I've heard about are young kids. Yeah. Right. I, okay. So, call them no labels. Uh, it, would, would would I be in favor of a uh, of a of a political movement that got behind uh, a mansion? <laughs> no. A Yunkin? No. Um, I, I just I don't see I, I actually don't see the point of it. Uh, it, it it's it, it, except to say like, we don't like uh, either of these other guys, um, and you know, the, the, and, and we get that anyway. I mean, we get that with with it, with a Ralph Nader. We get that with a Marianne Williamson. We get that with you know other people who put their names forward. So if uh, if if Trump doesn't get the Republican nomination, would he become a no labels? Candidate running as a as an independent. Yeah. The neighbor, the, the no labels thing at the moment scares me to death, frankly. Excuse me. Rather than no labels, it's sort of a combination of the two parties. Most of the people in this country have have principles that are both Republican and both Democrat. And if there were a combination party, that might do, please people. AOC and Biden don't represent one thing. They're not in one voice. If each party has a broad range. If you took the center from each party, you can call it a centrist party. Maybe we get someplace. Not with our system. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, but I mean, we've tried all of that. It, 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 and you know, within a particular election, it, it might, uh, it, it might last, but it never lasts beyond an election. Not, not with, uh, not with the winner-take-all system that we have. Do you see anyone on the political landscape that might change, make appropriate changes without a catastrophic event or a depression of any generation at this point? No. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I think um, a, um, <clears throat> a multi-party system with ranked choice voting, uh, ranked choice voting goes some part of the way toward achieving the same thing that multi-partisan does. And I don't think you necessarily need them together. Um, and I'm not, I haven't really thought through what it would look like if you did have them together. Uh, but I certainly think that the result of the ranked choice system 
in the places where it has been tried has shown that it tends to produce candidates of the center. It, 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 it gives you the result that a, that a you know, a, a neither of the above party would. Uh, and in, in Alaska, for example, in the last election, uh, we got a, a centrist Democrat and a central, centrist Republican coming out in a state in which the extremes on both sides uh, were rejected by the voters. And I think you're, those of the, you who have said that we are fundamentally a much more centrist country than our politics reflects are absolutely right about that. We need an electoral system that reflects that. Uh, and our electoral system right now, it, in fact, works in the opposite direction. It, it, it drives toward, toward the extremes. Uh, so ranked choice voting would be vastly preferable to winner take all as we have it now. And I think that a multi-party uh, democracy would, would, would go even further in, in that direction. But I think it, it, would, it would have that effect of, 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 of a much more moderate, much more centrist, much more collaborative government and, and, and politics than, than what we have today. And we have time for one last question. Can you explain, please, why the January 6th uh, attempted insurrection was not, is not, was not the cataclysmic event that you were speaking of, especially in light of 60 plus court cases being brought uh, that at least raise the question of whether there was any fraud. And if the Republican Party cannot see what it is that has gone on in that attempt, how is it that anything can possibly change? <laughs> yeah. Uh, th those, those are two very different questions. Um, on the first one, uh, you know, I think the reason it wasn't a cataclysmic event is because it failed. Uh, had it succeeded, it might have been the cataclysmic event uh, that, uh, <laughs> that we're talking about. Um, but because it failed, because, it, because, because the system held, the system worked in, 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 the, in the final analysis. What lesson the Republicans should take away from the failed attempt, uh, ob obviously, um, most of the people in this room feel that they should have taken away a different message than the one they apparently have taken away, which is to double down on Trump, uh, which uh, is, is, you know, as incomprehensible to me as it is to you. I mean, wh why, why, why has the Republican Party, um, having seen the, the danger to the republic that Trumpism represents, not turned its back on him and said, we need to go back to the kind of party we always have been. And uh, you know, so, so many of us have thought at various moments, including the Trump candidacy in the, to begin with, that the party would come to its senses uh, and, uh, and, and turn back to its traditional values. And it, it, has, it hasn't happened. And I think it hasn't happened in large part because of this issue that we've been talking about, that we have become so polarized and, and, and the system actually rewards polarization. It doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't work in the opposite direction. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> Thanks.